same in our eyes because he created a slightly different from what they are. We be talking the same things are. Welcome to Strange Familiars. How are you doing, Allison? I'm doing well. Are you excited? For... <laughs> Albatwitch Day. I am excited. This is the one event that I actually attend. I'm excited as well. Please come if it still rains. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a rain or shine event. Please come if it rains. We have a tent. We have a tent with walls. Yeah. We'll either be in the tent or under the overhang. At Columbia Crossing, I'm not sure which. I like the idea of having our own tent, our own space. So as long as it's not like pouring when we set up, we can set up the tent, we can put the walls on, and we should be pretty well protected from the weather. But we'll see. We'll be there, though, no matter what. We're going to be there. Albatwitch Day is rain or shine. It's at Columbia River Park at the Columbia Crossing building. It's 21 Walnut Street, Columbia, Pennsylvania. AlbatwitchDay.com if you want more information. We are debuting three new t-shirts there at Albatwitch Day. Mothman, mm -hmm. The Eyes of Night, and my favorite of the three, The Black Dog. So we've got moths, dogs, owls, and butterflies? Uh, Luna moth. Luna moth, okay. We've basically got all the best animals represented. <laughs> The Eyes of Night used to be on T Public, but this is a silkscreen version. A silkscreen print, in my opinion, is much better and more durable than the prints from T Public. So I'm very, very happy to get this design on a silkscreen printed shirt. I just think they're better. So while it was available before, I believe this is a better version. The Mothman shirt, the Black Dog shirt, those are new, new to strange familiars. Not been available in any form before. We also have totes. With the Mothman and the Eyes of Night design, there's only 12 each of those. They're an experiment. I didn't know how totes would do, so we just ordered light on them. So come on out if you want one of those at Albatwitch Day. Put all your t-shirts in. <laughs> there are things to do there when it's even when it's raining because the, in, the uh, speakers are all inside in the building. Mm -hmm. The trolley the, rides are, are inside, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, there's a roof on the trolley. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> Inside, in, in a sense. Yeah, yeah. And of course, you know, you still get food. You can eat under the overhang, you know. It's my favorite day of the year. For those of you that can't make it, the t-shirts should be on Etsy next week. We ordered plenty. I'm sure there's, there's going to be some left afterwards. On tonight's show, I'm going to be talking with Lorraine McAdam. She has a book called Phantoms in the Night or ETs. And we're going to be talking about UFOs, alien abductions, crop circles, and more. It's a long interview. I really enjoyed her. I really enjoyed her as a guest. So, And what was the name of the the title? Phantoms in the Night or ETs. Which is your choice. I okay. don't think they're little men from other planets. So. <laughs> no, I mean like Phantoms in the Night or ETs. I'll go with the Phantoms in the Night. <laughs> yeah, that was going to be mine. I, and I'm not particularly fond of Phantoms in the Night. I, they're just preferable to ETs. <laughs> Before we talk to Lorraine, I want to thank our patrons. Thank you so much, patrons. Thank you for everything you do. Thank you for your help. We could not make Strange Familiars without you. If you like what we do and you want to get extra content, you can become a patron at Patreon. It's patreon.com slash strangefamiliars. All of our patrons get commercial-free versions of the weekly shows, plus extra episodes. We do at least one full extra episode exclusive to our patrons every month. Often we do more than that. You can also sign up via Apple Podcasts. Apple Podcast subscribers get the patron episodes, and the weekly episodes without commercials as well. Just to let people know who are subscribed via Apple Podcasts, it takes a long time to add shows. I don't know why. It takes like 30 or 40 minutes to add one show there. I'm very slowly adding all the back patron episodes. I think I'm done with 2021 now. So there's all the patron episodes back, you know, that far. I'll keep at it as time allows. And we'll keep getting those patron episodes up there. Again, it's patreon.com slash strangefamiliars. 
Just one more note for patrons on Patreon. I just put a post up. It was last minute. I didn't have time to do pre-orders for these sweatshirts, these hoodies. And they're very expensive. I couldn't order a ton of them. I just made 10 of them up. Patrons get first shot at those. So if you're on Patreon, go look at it. I think there might be half of them are left at this point. There's only, uh, I think, one medium and then a few of each size, large, extra large, and 2X. I expect them to go before Apple Twitch Day. If they don't, uh, I will put them on Etsy next week, and everybody can have a shot at them, whatever's left. But again, that's another advantage of being a patron. You get first shot at stuff like that, patreon.com slash strangefamiliars. And I want to thank Jason W. for his PayPal donation. Very generous. Thank you so much, Jason. Thank you. You can also make a one-time donation. There's a paypal.me link in the show notes at strangefamiliars.com. Thank you, Jason W., for that. All right, let's go ahead and get to my conversation with Lorraine McAdam. We're talking with Lorraine McAdam. She has a new book called Phantoms in the Night or ETs, My Lifelong Experience of Contact with the Paranormal. How are you doing tonight? Uh, I'm great, thanks. It's quite late here, but um, I don't know what it's like where you are, but it's absolutely throwing it down outside. I, you can probably hear rain pitter pattering against my window. I don't know. I hope it, I can't hear it, but, but I'd be fine with it. If the little, little background ambience will be fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Before writing this book, without any, you know, you don't have to get into the weird experiences because we're going to definitely hit on those, but just like, you know, a little bit about your life outside of the paranormal. Well, my first career, I was a nurse. I was a nurse for 12 years. I trained to be a nurse back in the 80s, specializing in mental disabilities and psychiatric care. And I was a nurse for 12 years and I ended up specializing in. Uh, Alzheimer's, senile dementia patients. Eventually, I was senior staff nurse. And then I hurt my back, unfortunately. So what I did, I then went back to college, as you call it, I think, in the USA, and I retrained as a teacher. So I've been a, an English teacher now for 12 years. I quite enjoy my job, find it very rewarding. What I do is I work for something called the National Tuition Service, which has come about after covid uh, now, so I teach children that have got behind with um, their English over the internet, a one-to-one, and sometimes I, I teach small groups of children that have got behind in school for whatever reason, usually because of COVID quite often. So that's what I'm doing currently, and I really love my job. I find it very rewarding. I've always done kind of people-related professions. I feel like... I'm called to do that kind of thing. I'm also a voluntary counsellor. Did a counselling qualification two years ago. So I also, I want to do a further one though. With the OU, I'm thinking of doing a further one so that I can help people that have gone through similar things to myself, but also with ordinary everyday problems as well, not just high strangeness problems. Yeah. But that's where I am at the moment. I'm half my father is from Scotland. My mother is from the UK. I was born in Lancashire, UK, in Blackburn, Lancashire. And um, I was born in a town called Blackburn, but I'm now living in Cumbria, UK, in a place called the Lake District. It's a very beautiful place, full of mountains and lakes, as the name implies. Very pretty area of the world. So that that's me, basically, in a nutshell. <laughs> hope that tells you a bit about me. Sure, yeah. It's interesting that you were a nurse for a while. I, I really feel like and this might be a generalization, but just in the, the you know, the sm small sample of people I get to talk to that have been involved, you know, if they are contactees, whatever that yes. means, yeah. there seems to yeah. be a, a great percentage of people that are, that are in healing work in one way or another, whether they're energy workers or, or nurses or, you know, it's very oh, interesting. Right. That's interesting. But yeah. yeah. Uh, it's funny you should say that because even as a teacher, I've always ended up and I don't know whether this is face or whatever you want to call it, I've always gravitated towards working with children with autism who are on the autistic spectrum. Both of my sons also incidentally are on the autistic spectrum, and I wonder if that's fated or something, I don't know. Yeah, I've always kind of been helping children with ADHD as well, and I seem to have been drawn to special needs children within teaching as well, because a lot of children, the reason they get behind is because... 
of, of their problems comprehending things in a large class and that sort of thing. So then I end up teaching them again, you know, so to speak. So it's, so it's kind of happened within nursing and within teaching as well that, you know, I seem to have been drawn to helping people with mental disabilities really seems to have been a big theme through all of my career uh, choices. Yeah. And is this your first book? It's my first book, yes, definitely is. I was really surprised, actually, that it even got published um, because the first thing I thought, I hid this for 40 years, basically, these things that had happened to me. And the first thing I thought when I was offered a publishing contract was I was really, (laughs) can I use the phrase gobsmacked, I was really stunned because I hope you understand that in the USA, you know, because I just thought, I wouldn't be believed or they'd probably think I'm a complete lunatic or something, you know, but surprisingly I've had really nice things, you know, nice feedback and things from from what I've said in the book. And, and there's, there's already been two reviews of my book, which have been very positive. And I think there's perhaps a sea change going on as we speak. There's more openness, which is why I decided to come out with my story, because people often ask me, well, you know, why now? And... I am actually working on a second book, though, because I'm trying to explore further what's happened to me. But what I'm trying to do as well is starting from my own experiences, thinking about what I can garner from about the ETs that I've met from my own experiences and also how they choose to relate to us, you know, and and how it compares maybe to other abductee experiences that I've talk to. So that's what I'm working on. I've been unable to determine whether it's the fact that I do this podcast and I I talk to people with strange experiences every week, or if there is a general societal change and people are a little bit more open to this. Yeah. When I had my initial experiences in the late 80s and early 90s, you really couldn't talk too much about it. You you, you were made fun of. Yeah. Ditto. Yeah. Or just people laughed at you or it was just not, they didn't want to hear it, you know, where now people are interested, at least it seems, you know. I, I, yeah, I, that, 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 yeah. I remember I, I was saying in the 90s whenever I would say, hey, I, I think I had these abduction experiences and my, my mind has sort of changed on that over time. And, and we can talk about that as we go further. But people would immediately just say, oh, did you know, were you probed? And it was just so ridiculous. Oh, I know. I've, I've, I've had that too. Yeah. yeah. My first experience was with my own mother in the back in the 70s when I tried to articulate to her as a kid because that's what it started happen to, happening to me from the age of 12. And I tried to tell her what was happening to me and she wouldn't believe me. She said, oh, it's your imagination. Perfect. She just dismissed it as a vivid imagination. Uh, even when strange physical things happened to me, there was one particular night when they kind of drew some strange symbols on my nightdress and she accused me of doing that myself. There was another night when I actually got locked out of the house and I had to knock to be let, let back in. And it was almost like they were saying, because I was a Christian at that point, and there was nothing at all to indicate that it was in ETs. I mean, I never even thought about it being ETs. I, I assumed it was demon persecution, actually, because I was a Christian, a strong Christian, you know, at that point in my life. There was nothing on abduction or that phenomena till the sort of uh, late 80s, you know, when communion came up. So I blamed it on demons, but it was almost like the ETs were trying to tell me, no, we're not demons, we're actually something physical that you're interacting with because they put me back outside and I had to be, I knocked my mum to get, to let, let me back into the house at the back door and she blamed me for that. She said I'd climb down the downpipe as if I would do that, you know, because wow. it was very delicate. And she just dismissed it all, you know, and... So I just wasn't believed and I gave up, you know, I just thought. And yet to have to experience this on your own and compartmentalise it, which is what I did to kind of try and stay sane with your ordinary life, it was very hard, you know, it was it was very frightening. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's isolating in a way. It's very isolated, yes. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So 12 is pretty young for this to start happening. Were you cognitive <laughs> of it from the beginning of like, what was going on or, or see, I have like kind of shady memories, at least at first. And then later on, I kind of put it together. No, I wasn't. Um, I put it down because I was brought up a Catholic, a strong Catholic. 
And I put it down to demonic persecution. I thought, am I being, are they trying to possess me? You know, especially when I saw the pale face, faces and the big black eyes of the, what I, we've come to know as the typical grey. It was only in 1993 when I found a copy of Communion. Can I just hold this up? Because this is what I saw. This was the, the original book cover. Uh-huh. Can you see that? Okay. Oh, I, rem- yeah. I remember that intensely. Yeah. And I saw that and it terrified me because it made me realise. And I thought, the first thought that I had was, I know that face. I've seen that. That was familiar to me immediately. So I immediately bought the book from this bookshop and I read it through twice. And I got this kind of almost PTSD after effect after reading this book because I had to, what I previously put down to demon persecution or and talked to the church about and, and they prayed over me and nothing happened to stop it. I had to face up to the fact that I've been interacting or possibly interacting with some kind of ETs and that was very, very frightening for me. It really affected me on a very deeply, you know, it made me very frightened Yeah, to actually face up to that. So again, just, just comparing notes. Yeah. yeah. My initial reaction to the cover of Communion was disgust. I, said, I don't. Right, literally. I yeah, don't know yeah. what that is. I don't want to yeah. deal with it. I would literally like look away. Yeah. I didn't know yeah. why. I, yeah. I, I didn't know why. I was having what I thought were nightmares of things standing next to my bed. Oh God! Yeah, being there with yeah. uh, in my. Now I came to realize these were screen memories. At least I think they were. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. They were short little guys. In, yeah, they are short. In yeah. doctors, yeah. they looked like they were dressed like doctors from like a 1920s movie you know like yeah very, that, very... that's a screen thing i think um because yeah. they came to me as cats and, and owls. owls yeah I, I had a very vivid dream that two cats i know this sounds really weird with big eyes huge eyes floated me out of bed and through the bed the bedroom wall and the strange thing was in this dream i put that in inverted commas i could see all the cobwebs inside the wall and then i remember being pulled up to a cylindrical craft that was lit blue light underneath, and I, and and, that, and then I blacked out at that point. It was like my, my, I couldn't cope with it, you know. But that's what I actually recalled. So, you know, I mean, that is just amazing to me, really, that I even remembered that. For me, it was months and months later after seeing after communion was. I don't know how long it was published, but when I was seeing it in bookstores, yes, months yeah. and months later, there was a a news story on an evening news program here. And it was just like, hey, you know, we're going to talk about UFOs and people who think they're being abducted by aliens. And I just watched it, not because I thought it was happening to me. It just sounded interesting to me. Yeah. And, and yeah. I don't remember if they did reenactments or if it was just people's drawings. But when I saw that, it was like getting punched in the stomach. Yeah, that's exactly how it feels. That screen memory yeah, was literally like dropped. And I yeah. can no longer see those doctors by my bed anymore. I, yeah. s- I see grays by my bed yeah. and yeah. and it was very strange and and very disconcerting and very like I guess a very similar thing to what you're explaining it's just like what what whoa like yeah it, it's, it is like that you've described it really well a blow to the solar plexus I would say definitely yeah yeah it's very frightening yeah so I have to acknowledge it now so I have to face it yeah I've had a contentious relationship with the Greys. <laughs> yeah, <And> decent. <laughs> I was a cradle Catholic, and I fell away from the church. I'm I'm back with the church now. But my experience is, and I don't know what to make of this. I think if they were demons, there'd be more of a problem. But I yeah. can end any experience with them by saying the Hail Mary, and I will wake up and I will sit up in my bed, and it's yeah, it's ended. Now, saying that, yeah. and I always make this caveat, yeah. there are Wiccans who use Wiccan. There are, there are Muslims who use Muslim prayer and, and Jewish people yeah. with the same experience. Yeah. Right? yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. It, to me, it says it's something maybe about belief, you know, not so much yeah. about my particular religion or anyone's particular yes. religion, but yeah. something about Absolutely. belief that's wound into yeah. it. But uh, just, just bringing that up, because you, you did uh, mention being born Catholic, so... How old are you when you when you realize this, when you see communion and then sort of read the book and then you're starting to put it together? I was a senior staff nurse by this point. I was working in a private, so a small private hospital as, as a nurse. Uh, I was doing 40 hours a week on night duty. 
uh, it would be around circa around 1993. And I used to, because um, I remember reading it at work uh, in between bouts of, you know, because it's quite traumatizing. You get time to do a little bit more than you would have the day and you just operate, you know. So I would be about um, 29, something like that, I'd be 20, before I realized. But I found it, as I say, very traumatizing. And the fact was, it's still isolating because you, you can't really tell anyone. You can't tell your colleagues about it because they'll look at you like you're a bit mental. Yeah, I, I imagine. I did attempt. If yeah. you're in a professional situation like that, you have to be even yeah. more careful about it. I was in college. So I was a little bit freer, able to like sort of, you know, test the waters with who I could tell and stuff. Didn't work out well anyway, yeah, no. but at least I wasn't yeah. in danger of losing a job. Yeah, this is the problem. What I, I literally used to hide the cover. Um, I, put, I actually, you know, like you could, could bind book covers with um, plain paper. Yeah, I actually yeah. did that on purpose so that nobody would know what I was reading and nobody questioned it, thankfully. Because I was so frightened somebody would see the face and, and, and ask me, what the heck are you reading, you know? But really, I was scared that somebody would, but nobody ever did. But um, I found it all very scary, you know, and very isolating. And it's only recently, you know, as I say, that the only person I tried to tell was my fiancé, who, who I met my second husband in 1994. And we lived together for two years before we got married and they took me from right next to him and I'd be screaming inside my head because they used to paralyse me so I couldn't move or anything. So I'd scream inside my head, help me, help me, but it never it never worked. And I tried to tell him, even my own fiancé, and, you know, obviously we were close, and he just looked at me like I was completely mad and, and it just made me realise how futile. He just pulled my leg and whistled the tune to the uh, the Twilight Zone, you know, and <laughs> I just thought, I'm wasting my breath here, you know. Uh, but recently, as time has gone on, my husband has acknowledged that something strange has been happening around me because other things have happened that have convinced him that I'm actually telling the truth, you know, that I'm not making this up, so to speak. So, so how often do you think these these things were happening as when you were a child and up through you know early adulthood until until you discovered that's what it was when you read communion it happened a lot from 12 to 16 it happened more or less at least once maybe even sometimes twice a week oh and wow. what would happen is that i don't know whether you can identify with this but i would become uh, i would hear like a buzzing noise and it would get louder and louder and it would fill me from top to toe eventually almost like I was vibrating and it's like sounds like the sound of a lot of bees mm -hmm. and then I would just black out and it would go from night time to daytime and I would know it was happening and I would try and pray I would cry out to God please deliver me from this and sometimes I have to say that did work because I would cry to Jesus please deliver me from these demons as I thought they were and sometimes that worked and sometimes it didn't so that that was quite hard and then from 16 onwards, it seemed to stop for a time when I went to do um, my pre-nursing course and my nursing training. I didn't see a lot of things. I had one. I had a sighting of a UFO when I was on night duty during training years. But that's all really that happened out of the ordinary. And then it kind of started to happen again in the early 90s to me, right through up until and after I got married intermittently, not as often as it did through my teens. Mm -hmm. So there doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason or pattern to it. It just seems to stop and start and then suddenly it starts again, you know, and you just wonder what kind of schedule they've got, you know, if, if they have a schedule even, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I had thought I was done with it probably 15 years ago or more. I thought it had been so long. I thought, well, I guess that's, that's in the past. Yeah. Yeah, and exactly. And then out of nowhere, a couple of times. Yeah. And now again, yeah. I, I've been able to stop it. But one time I had some, some physical effect from it. And I don't know what's happening. Well, that's a good question. Do you think, and there's no wrong answer to this. Yeah. I've come in to liken it to sort of sort of like an out-of-body experience. And, yeah. and I will often say like, yes, I've been abducted, but I never left my bed. That's really hard for people to wrap their head around. 
but I think they're somehow pulling me out of my body and I'm having this, this outer body experience. Well, you obviously were physically removed because you were outside the, a couple of times. Or do you think both things could be true? Or, you know, I'm just wondering your thoughts on it. I actually think both things could be true because I've had experiences where I felt like I was pulled out of my body. I was taken down a long tunnel and I was paralyzed. I couldn't move, but I was being held by someone from behind. And it was like, we're floating down this huge long white tunnel. And when we came to the end of it, I could see a city, what appeared to be a city filled with kind of very white stucco type buildings. Although I have had also had interactions with what we call the Nordic ETs as well. And on that occasion, I felt as if that might be a Nordic ET. But um, I was awake throughout that. So I wonder if I was and yeah, I came back to and I seemed to slam into my body. So I wonder if that was an OBE experience. But yes, I've been physically put back in the wrong place twice. I was taken during my second pregnancy and I was put back. I know you're going to laugh at this in under the kitchen table. Yeah. It's, it's funny, but it's not funny. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, yeah. It's I a, mean, it's... you have to kind of try and find humor. Yeah. Yeah. You know, to cope with it, you know, but. I was very angry at the time because I was quite heavily pregnant. I thought, why have you put me back here? You know, I was sure? cursing and getting quite angry about it early early hours of the morning. And then my husband just said, oh, you sleep well. But I know I, I hadn't because I felt them. I, I knew, you know, I'd have the paralysis thing and I'd had the initial blackout when you're being taken, you know. So, And it's very hard to cope with. And it was terrifying because I'd read that pregnancies, women find themselves pregnant and then they're no longer pregnant. And I was terrified oh, yeah. that my pregnancy would be interfered with, but, but neither of them was. Good. But both my boys, I was taken during both pregnancies, but both my boys are extremely bright. They've never really had to try at school. In fact, my first son, one of the teachers said he's like a little professor and he was only fine. You know, she said he's like, He's so bright. And I, I had to wonder about that, you know. And I thought, I wonder if they've done something or really. Have you ever spoken to them about these experiences? Yes, I have. My eldest says he doesn't feel he's seen anything. Although he, on one occasion, he did say he felt he'd seen what I described as the greys in his bedroom. And the other one, he says, well, when he was 10, he came running to me all hysterical and said there was a monster in his bedroom and I went to look and there was nothing there. And I said, well, describe this monster and what I described because I didn't want to tell him. You know, I deliberately didn't say and what I described was your typical grey and that frightened me a bit, but I tried to calm him down. I tried not to say anything and I just said, oh, don't worry about it. And then nothing seemed to happen after that. But then... As he's got older, he, he had another experience where he saw a grey. Um, and this grey kind of just, he said he just faded out when he saw me looking at him. And also he said he had a very vivid dream where he was pulled through his bedroom wall. This is my youngest son. And he ended up having a conversation with what we really view as a typical Nordic, blonde aliens. And he said he was wearing some kind of pale blue tight fitting uniform. And then he said, I just woke up, but he said it was a very vivid dream. He felt like it was real, so I don't know. But I have to wonder, because he, he is very intelligent too, they both are. And I was taken with him in all the tra- through all the trying best as the, the youngest one. I was carrying him when I was put back under the kitchen table. <laughs> I was really cross about that. I know my son, there's something going on, and he won't talk to me about it. Because I think part of it is because he knows... This is what I do for a living yeah. and, and, and all yes. this. He, he doesn't yeah. want to become yeah. fodder for the show and, and so forth. But I keep, I pull a little bit out of him and then I'll pull back. And from what it sounds like, there's more going on there than, than I ever had. But he just won't talk to me yeah. about it. He just won't. Yeah, he will probably eventually open up to you. It's very hard to do, isn't it? <laughs> I found it very hard to tell my own story. The main reason I did it in the end was because I wanted to reach other people that had gone through similar things and also because I think I was looking for validation from people like yourself and other people. And I've had people say to me already, you know, what I've gone through mirrors a lot of what you say you've gone through. People from all over the world, you know, 
that have talked to me on Facebook and through my email starting to talk to me. I actually had a person from New York contact me to say he'd been reassured by my book because it gave him validation. So I was pleased about that because I thought, well, it's doing what I wanted it to do, you know, to reach people who've gone through similar experiences. So That's one of the blessings of this podcast is, and not just with ET stuff, but with ghosts, with Bigfoot sightings, with all over, as you get so many people who will hear somebody and then they'll contact you and say, thank goodness that happened to me. I'm not crazy or, you know, finally I can talk about it. And it gives people the sort of push that then then they'll go ahead and tell their story. And yeah. it's sort yeah. of, I don't know if it's, you can normalize stuff like this because it's, it's very bizarre. It's, it's very strange stuff, but it does get people talking and people, again, I don't know if it's just, this, this is where I live and it seems like people are more open to it, but it really seems like people get more comfortable the more people share their stories and they're more likely to share their own then, which is important. Yeah. Like, you yeah. know, no matter what this turns out to be, I think it's good to document this stuff and get it out there for various reasons. Do you have any thoughts what they're trying to do, what they're doing through all this? Like, are they trying to breed with us? Or are they trying to, you know, do, what is the purpose? I have read that the Greys have said that they, I mean, it's difficult, isn't it, to tell, but I've read that the Greys have said that the planet is dying and I theorise that maybe that they're trying to leave something of themselves by blending it with us. I don't necessarily think that they're, there is a, a school of thought that says they're trying to get the high, they're making lots of hybrids to take over that can withstand maybe the planet after it's been subject to global warming. I, I don't know whether I subscribe to that. I think maybe they're just trying to su- keep a part of themselves to survive through the, maybe this hybrid program, I don't know. And I think also the Nordics have contacted me on occasion and I've always felt that the contacts I've had with them have been quite benevolent and almost like they were saying to me that that I was family in some way. And I don't know whether that's through my DNA or whether that is through at a soul level, if that makes sense. Because I've always felt like I don't quite belong here, if that makes sense. I don't know whether it does. I've always had a feeling from being a child that planet didn't seem to, it didn't feel right being here at times. I, f- I felt like I'd landed on an alien planet myself, if that, I don't know whether that makes any sense. And I feel like I resonate with them on a, on a, almost like a familial level. Is it? And I was telling um, someone else about this and he said, well, why don't you get a regress back to some past lives and see what you find? So I'm actually exploring that as an idea as well because I feel as if I may have had lives on other planets, not just this one, if that makes sense. Interesting. Yeah. There's kind of two theories. Like there's sort of, well, there's multiple theories. But uh, the two main theories are the sort of interdimensional things or they're interplanetary things. Yes, yeah. Do you weigh in on either of those? or? I think some of it is interplanetary, but I think some of it could be interdimensional as well. And and I think I feel as if they're trying to show us that there's far more to the universe than we realise or that we allow for. With Certainly with the greys, I think the physics are yards ahead of our physics. They can change things at a quantum level, I believe, because if they can float you through a wall, to me that seems miraculous to us. But I think my own theory is what they're doing is there may be their understanding at a quantum level of what things are is far greater than ours, so they can therefore do these things. Also, I think they might even have what we call portal technology or wormhole technology. Certainly, I've I've kind of theorised that they can jump in space and things like that, things that we've only theorised so far. There is a theory that there are about wormholes in space that's put forward by our own physicists. I think they've, they've done that. They've been there and done that. And I think the Nordics have similar sorts of technologies. I also firmly believe they have cloaking technologies or the ability to let you see them if they want you to and that they can cloak themselves and their craft because that's happened. Certainly what I've experienced, I think that that they're quite capable of doing that. And also with manipulating your mind, and I don't know whether they use technology to do that, 
to implant these screen memories or whether it's some natural ability within them. Certainly, I feel that, that certainly with the greys, I feel they have a natural ability maybe to be able to control us through some kind of hypnotism with the large eyes. I don't know. I've experienced where I was really ill with flu on one occasion when I was a student, I was doing my bachelor's degree. I was really, really ill with flu. It was going around and my temperature was sky high and a grey actually was sighted in my room. And after that, my temperature went back down. So I believe they're capable of healing as well if they want to, you know, that sort of thing I've experienced with them. Yeah, so it's been a mixed bag with them really. Have they ever spoken to you either via mouth or mind speak and given you any information or messages or anything like that? They've spoken to me. On, yes. What happened was, I don't know whether you read my book, but I was seriously ill in Cyprus in 1986. And um, I believe that I had an encounter there with both the Nordics and possibly with the Greys as well, because and this is where I'm led to wonder are they enemies? Some people make out that they're enemies, but I wonder if they actually work working together under one federation or organisation or something because I was taken into uh, Ayanapa Hospital with severe food poisoning. I passed out in the ambulance and when I came to, there were four long people around this young man and to me, I just took them to be Swedish people on holiday and I'd never heard of the Nordic ETs or anything. I hadn't even you know, met with the communion book or anything at this point. I was still very religious. And I'm going to tell you now, proves to me that they were physical people because I was a bit dazed and a bit confused. And I asked one of the visitors, there were two girls and two boys around this bed. And I just said, can you help me get to the loo? Because I couldn't find my call bell. I was just confused or something. And this beautiful girl, she was really beautiful, perfect skin, really good looking girl. She actually helped me to the loo. I felt so embarrassed having to ask her. She got me a wheelchair, put me in it, took me to the loo, brought me back, put me back in bed. I thanked her and I held her hand for a moment. I said, thank you, you're very kind. Just thinking, dismissing this as she was some kind of Swedish girl, you know, that was on holiday visiting a Swedish, this man that was in the bed next to mine. Anyway, the next thing I fell back to sleep, I was very weak and I woke up because the nurse was trying to adjust the saline drip in my hand. It had come out. That sometimes happens when you're on intravenous saline, the Cypriot nurse. And I looked at the bed next to me. It was completely made up, nearly made up, nobody there. And I I immediately said to this Cypriot nurse, I said, where's that young man gone that was in, that Swedish man that was in the bed next to mine? I said he had visitors early. She said, there's not been anyone in here since you've been in. You've been on your own all the time in this ward. Yes. Make what you will of that. Right. Very strange. And then, yeah, exactly. So how can a non-existent person physically put you in, a, get a wheelchair, put you in it, take you to the loo, bring you back and put you up in bed? And I've since run this by friends and, and then to a larger audience in my book. And to me, when I look back on it, of course, it was 1986. At that point, I'd, I'd never even thought about it. Do you know what I wrote it off as in the end? Because I was a Catholic. I wrote it off as angels in disguise. You know, Jesus talks about angels being sure. in disguise yeah. when you're distressed in stressful situations. I just wrote it off. It was sport of five angels that had masqueraded. So I just wrote it off as angels. And then on the Sunday, it got even weirder because I'd really wanted to go to church and begged people to take me, but they were a bit short-staffed. And the weird thing was, and I do talk about this in my book, that uh, this nurse called Corolla, she had really huge eyes, and you know, you talk about the hybrids. They have huge eyes, don't they? But I didn't know any of this at the time. Now, she looked like an ordinary Cypriot nurse, apart from her eyes look a bit big. And uh, she said, I'll take you to chapel. She said, I'll, I'll take you. She said, I know you've been asking. So she took me on the Sunday. And the weird thing was that it, with her, I felt safe. She took me through the cactus garden, put me in a wheelchair. She was a physical person again, as solid as you or I. She took me to this 
chapel that appeared to be like a typical Mediterranean chapel on the outside, you know, kind of stucco, kind of white on the outside. But when I got inside, the weird thing was that I didn't panic, but it was really dark inside this so-called chapel. And I remember she took me and put me in a pew and I remember sitting in the pew and then she said something very strange for a Catholic chapel. She said, would you like to speak to our elder because he'll make you feel better? She didn't say priest. She didn't Mm. say father. Yeah. Why elder? Why elder? Why not priest? Why not father in a Catholic country? And another weird thing was I was the only one there with her. Now, why weren't there other patients? You know, all this seems like it was, when I look back on it, like it was she was in control of a situation, if that makes sense. And then suddenly this so-called elder or priest or whatever you want to call him was suddenly next to me. There was no footsteps behind me always coming down, you know, no footsteps, nothing. He was just suddenly there. And he said to me, you know, and these were the words he said. He said, why did you want to come to church to find God? And I said, because being a Catholic, I thought of God as being kind of compartmentalised in a box in the church. It'll be in the church, you know. And he said to me, why do you need to come to church? God is all around us and through us. God is everywhere. And I didn't understand that at the time. And I just said, is he? Is he really? And he said, yes, God is everywhere. And one day you'll understand this. Like he, he knew what I was thinking. And I understand that now. What he was trying to say was that that God is the source of everything and that God is in and through everything. Around us, you know, everything is from God, basically. And when I look back on that, I think, was that a grey elder? Because the bit I'm going to tell you now is she took me back, put me back in bed, didn't think anything of it. She was in the same uniform all the other nurses' room. And the next day, male charge nurse came to, you know, do all my morning bath and stuff because I was too weak to get out of bed you know you know to to get out of bed without assistance I mean and I said where's Carola because I wanted to get her address I'd kind of warmed this woman and he said there's no nurse Carola on this ward and that hit me you know and I just thought what the hell is going on right and it was just and I just thought what the heck have I just and I actually thought at the time am I going bonkers I actually thought you know I'm going completely mad here and I never associated that with ETs or anything until I look back on it now with research and retrospect and things I've since found out and read about how they can masquerade and give you screen memories and so forth. And I think, did they come to me at a time when I was in great distress in a foreign country, when I was essentially alone yeah. and very vulnerable? I just don't know. I have no way of... It's so interesting, like looking back, there's a period of in, when I was very young, what I thought for years and years and years were just recurring dreams. I would wake up terrified, usually in the very early morning. It was it was daylight. It was not dark. And I would hear people speaking in the language that I couldn't understand. Oh, yes. I've had that too. Whispering. Yeah. 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 And I, you I, can I had... barely hear it, but you hear it and you think, what the heck are they talking about? My mom yeah. was, you know, very Catholic mom, but she was also very pro education. And there, I don't think I was ever told I wasn't allowed to read a book. You know, like whatever book I wanted, yes. yeah, I could, I could read. Yeah. And I would, there was a, I grew up on a farm in the country, and there was a library the next town over, the closest library, very small library, maybe you know, ten by ten feet, you know, just a few books. But what they had was this series of books called Man, Myth, and Magic. And it was, it's what it sounds like. It's it's you know all, all about mythology and religion and and uh, folklore and stuff. And I just found it super fascinating as a kid. Oh yes, yeah. And yeah. I would get one of these every week. It was an encyclopedia set. I would get you know I just go through the encyclopedia and then start over again at a. I just loved this, this book series. I would just read through it. And I think because I was reading those books, I decided that these voices were were witches. <laughs> and they were they, they were doing they were having some kind of witch's Sabbath. The only thing I knew was like they can't know I'm awake. I have to be quiet. They can't know I'm awake. Yeah, yeah. Re- yeah. Recurring dream. Oh, it's, you know, throughout maybe the ages of like yeah. maybe six to ten, something like that. And I don't yeah. know how many times I had it. Not dozens, but maybe ten, maybe maybe fewer, but enough where I remember yeah. it frequently. Yeah. But as an adult, I'm looking back. You know, I'm thinking about these experiences. I'm looking back. I'm like, 
that's a very odd and very specific dream to have again and again. And well, I was I'm sure st- I, I was sure yeah. I was awake. There was no ever yeah, a moment. Yeah, there, there was never yeah. a moment where I then woke up from that. I was in bed awake, and and it's it's just very strange. So you look back on your life, and you you sort of pick out these moments where you're like, yeah, that was really weird. And now in the late of this other stuff, you know, it sort of colors it a different way. But- yeah, definitely. Yeah, uh, I mean, I strangely enough, my experiences started with that whispering conversations. I would often hear that would often precede the being paralyzed and then blacking out. I would hear these loud whispers, like they were having some kind of conversation about what they were going to do or yeah. goodness knows, I'm only guessing at that. Yeah. Almost like they, they wanted you to hear them. Right. It started for me with whispering actually and hearing voice them talking. So I have I've can fully identify with that. I, I had that too quite often. I guess because I don't know if it was three. I don't remember well enough to remember three distinct voices, but I remember having the impression always there was three of them. Always there was yeah, there was that, three. Yeah, that, that makes sense to me. Yeah, I used to think maybe a couple. Is... I don't know. That's what I perceived. I actually saw on one occasion when I'd heard them first, and again I th- I wonder if this was a way of them trying to make me realize that it wasn't demons, that it was something physical. But I actually saw the hands and it absolutely terrified me. You, you know, the long fingered hands, the pale gray hands. And I realized these weren't human hands and it terrified me. And my reaction was a hostile one. To, and I dug my fingernails into the hand and their reaction was to dig the fingernails back. And then when I came round from what I believe was an abduction, I had the nail, the marks in my hand and that absolutely terrified me. Wow. Because I realized, because I've written it off as a nightmare. Yeah, how old you know? were you at this point? I would be about 13 at this okay. point. Okay, wow. Yeah, well, quite young, really. You yeah, know? yeah. And bearing in mind, as my attempts to tell, try and articulate what was happening to my mum were just written off as vivid imagination. You know, it was it was very frightening, very isolating experience. Yeah, definitely. So I was in college, at least by the time I sort of, put it together and I don't have yeah. a, a ton yeah. of memory I have those early childhood memories I have yes. another experience yeah. where I, I saw a UFO at I'm, I guess around the age eight and my mom actually woke me up she said do you want to see a UFO but I mean what eight-year-old boy is gonna say no I don't want to see you know I was in bed and just yeah I want to see a UFO and I remember watching wow. this UFO again we lived on a farm it's you know rural setting over the trees on the horizon with I'm the youngest of six kids so it was the next two kids in age to me, my, my sister and my, my brother was next oldest to me. And uh, they got bored and said, well, we're going inside. My mom too. <laughs> but I, I had a very protective dog and it wasn't unusual for me to be outside at night with, without it. It was, just yeah. 19, yeah. it was a different time, 1970. Yeah, yeah. I but I remember it. watching that UFO and I was so fascinated by it. My next memory is watching it from inside through the window. I have no recollection of going back inside. Now, I don't know. No, that's strange. Yeah, yeah, I don't don't know know if there's anything there or not. I don't know. You know, maybe I just don't remember. Or maybe there's missing time. I don't know. Now, you said you saw the one UFO. Have you seen other UFOs throughout your life? Yes. The first strange thing I saw, I was bringing my elder son back from school. We, We saw this together. And it was one of the tri- classic triangular ones. And I said to him, I saw it in the distance, so I pulled the car in so we could get out of the car and actually watch it. When we both got out of the car, he got out of the other side. And I couldn't believe my own eyes because it came in closer and closer and it, it was massive and it came right over us. Classic triangular craft with the red lights, at, three red lights at the corners of the triangle. And um, we watched it together and I said, did... And I couldn't believe my own eyes. I actually just, I said to Christopher, did you just see what I just saw? And he said, yes, I did see it, Mum. So that was the first one I actually saw over where we live here in Cumbria. And then during 2008, that was seemed to be an intensive contact time for me with what I would call, I believe, to be the Nordic ETs. Because how that started was in the July of 2008, And again, I'm going to call this a dream. It was a very vivid dream. And I had a dream that 
I went outside and on my lawn was parked a cream-coloured tic-tac-shaped craft. And then it suddenly opened in the middle and out got this Nordic-looking male, very tall, very good-looking. And I went over and shook his hand and then I woke up and I thought nothing of this dream. And then we kind of were taking the children to the library a couple of days later and we were coming back and my husband saw it. I didn't see it at first. He saw these, like, strange formations in a field that was close to us as that we'd be passing on our um, right-hand side. And he said, oh, look at that. And he pulled the car in. And I said, oh, that's weird. And they were kind of like swastika shapes and H shapes in this field and kind of just emphasised that the swastika was stolen by Hitler. It's actually yeah. a very ancient symbol, isn't it? It was given to the... It comes from, I think it's in a lot of cultures. It's it not is. just Native Americans, yeah, Indians. Yeah, the Oregon Indians. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, we looked at this, and my husband's very logical, very scientific. And it was only at this point that he was starting to listen to me about, or, or beginning to think that there was something in what I was saying about contact experiences. And he went in this field, and I remember going in and being really puzzled and saying, well, I can only see my footprints go in and out, so that's got to have come from the air. And the strange thing was that we drove back, you know, we thought, no, we got back in the car, and we drove back, and on our, our drive was parked a black Land Rover with two blonde people in it. One of them was a man, one of them was a woman. And my husband immediately said, who was that, Who's that cheeky pair parked on our drive? So he saw this as well, it wasn't just me. But what shocked me was that the man that was at the wheel, if you want, the blonde man that was at the wheel, now you, you're going to find this because it shocked me. It was the same, because I have a brilliant memory for faces, and I immediately recognised that it was the man, I know you're going to find this fantastic, it was the man from my dream, dreaming in bed, you know, and as soon as he saw me, he looked shocked, and they drove off, they kind of whizzed off, and I thought, what the hell is going on is what went through my mind. And then... In that or the August of that same year, 2008, it was very, very hot. So I left my curtains open, consequently, and the windows open because we don't have air conditioning in England because we don't get the heat for long enough, you know, to be bothered with air conditioning. But I was woken up a lot because I was hot and sweaty. So I kind of got up to make myself a cup of tea and I noticed these white lights and they were coming together. They were zigzagging, coming apart, coming together coming apart, coming together, and they're over this same field where we'd seen the crop form, the, what I would call crop formations. They weren't circles, but they were still, I believe, nonetheless formations. And I saw those, and I thought, this is weird. And I watched them for a while, and then I went back to sleep. And then a bit later, over that same field, I witnessed, um, it was almost like somebody said, go back and have a look over the field again, because at that time, there was no, we've had an estate built in front of us now, but at that time there was nothing but just fields in the distance and you could see right across and you could see the mountains in the distance. And over that same field off the B6263, it was almost like I was called to go to the window again, I can't describe, and there was a cylindrical craft and it was huge, it was absolutely huge, and it had yellow and green lights. And I was absolutely stunned and fascinated all at the same time by this and I just watched it. And it was almost like they were showing off whoever it was because they kind of went on the side like a wheel. And I would estimate that when it was on its side, it was at least the height of two double-decker buses. It was very huge, huge yeah. craft. And these lights were flashing along the edge of it. And it was almost like they were showing off or something. And then it, it turned back, hovered over the field, and then just vanished. It just vanished. And I thought, where have you gone? It was just like, one minute it was there, next minute it was gone. And I told my husband about this and he just like took the mickey a bit and hung the tune to the twilight zone. I said, if, if I see those white lights again, I said, I'm going to go and investigate. And a few days later, I went to investigate because I saw the zigzagging white lights. I thought, I'm going to go and investigate this. I'm going to go and see what, there's something funny going on here. You know, and I'm going to kind of investigate what's going on. So I went to see and right at the side of that field, and I've since talked to a ufologist about this there was a craft on the ground and it, it seemed almost felt like we, they were waiting for me and, and 
I kind of stopped the car and I was so stunned by what I was seeing and so kind of terrified because what immediately went through my mind, I had two young children at the time. They're not now, but they were at the time. I thought, they're going to take me and not bring me back. And it was like an egg-shaped craft and it was on the ground and there were what I took to be two males in silhouette, one at either side of it. And it was almost like they were waiting for me to get out of the car and go and have a close-up. Well, I didn't want to, so I just sped off. But I ended up, and this is the weird thing, I ended up, and I'm a good driver normally, so this is just so weird. Because to come back into our village, if you go to the roundabout, you have to go all the way around and come back. But I didn't. I was in such a flat, I was so confused and so panicked that I went straight onto the M6 heading south. So I was heading away from the village the wrong way. And I pulled in at a service station. And this is the weird, it gets weird at this actually. And I saw immediately in front of me this huge white, what I took to be a white lorry or truck, as you say in America, you call them trucks. trucks. And um, no logos or anything on this lorry, just plain white, not lit up, no lights. And this guy kind of leans out and, and in a panic, I say, can you help me? I need to head back north towards Scotland. I've come up come on the M6 by mistake. I mean, how do you do that by mistake? I've come the wrong way. And um, he didn't say anything, but he indicated for me to follow him. And I just seemed to implicitly trust this guy. I mean, I don't know why when I look back on this. And as I was following this lorry, <laughs> you to come at, you, what do you see if you're following a lorry at night? Brake what lights or, or rear lights, you should yeah, see. Yeah. Of course you do. And it was almost like, when I look back on it, that they were controlling this because there were no lights. All I could see was a white screen. And I took that to be the back of the lorry. Now, you would see in a lower, you'd be lower down, wouldn't you? You'd see the tyres, you wouldn't see a white screen, and you would see the lights. Yeah. But I didn't see any of that, those things. All I saw was a white screen. And um, in my mind at the time, it was like they were saying, we're going to, to take you over a bridge, and, and you, you're going over a bridge, you're going to be put down back head in the right way and I felt myself plop down that's all I can remember and I was heading back north towards Scotland but then when I went back to that service station I found you cannot turn round there there is no bridge there's a passenger bridge but there's no bridge there's no bridge for cars you have to go to the next exit and if you do want to go around the barrier you have to ask the staff to lift it and then you will go down minor country roads and you will not go anywhere near the motorway to get back heading that way. I've since looked and anyone's welcome to do the same. So what the hell happened? I think looking back on it that maybe it was some kind of screen memory and that they lifted me up knowing what they'd done mm-hmm. and put me back the right head in the right way. And I've since told a friend, a ufologist, and he thinks maybe I was on board a, a craft of some sort, and that's why I could just see this plain white wall in front of me. It's possible. And I know I've had stories on the podcast where people have missing time. And when Well, there they... was missing time as well with oh, that event. okay, yeah. Yeah, and, there was an hour or so, yeah. When, when they come back too, they, they're either miles and miles ahead on the highway of where they were, or yeah. they're going the other direction. Yeah. And they're yeah, like, how, yeah. how did this happen? Why am I going the yeah. other way? Yeah. There's no way, though. I mean, effectively, I was put back head in the right way. Right. There was no way I could have turned around there. Yeah, that's and, strange. And head back up the motor. There's just, you can't do it. You can't be done. So it's puzzled me. And it's been one of the reasons if I was going to be regressed, I would love to be regressed back to that night. Yeah. To see what the hell happened. Yeah. A, yeah. Uh, now, I, you know. I, I wanted to get regret. I was very much warned against it by some people. I don't know enough to tell you either way. You know, they were just like, yeah, you better, you better be careful about who you get to regress you. You know, it was the advice I, I was given. This is what happens. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I've had a, a very silly moment with Grace. Wonder if you ever had something like that. Like I saw it just briefly. It was a very sort of intense time in my personal life, and I woke up. I was alone. I wasn't sleeping in my bedroom. I was sleeping in this sort of little uh, little room we have with a l- little bed in it. And there was a bunch of them in the room, like more than I thought could ever fit in this little room. 
Yeah. And they were dressed, they looked silly. They were, it almost looked like <laughs> they were, they had Native American ritual gear on, but it was all like day glow colors and like, it's just absolutely silly. And again, I've had a very contentious relationship with them. I, uh, you know, I've just, I've never understood what they wanted and I've never been fully on board with whatever they want to do. So I'm usually, whenever I see them, I'm usually, you know, ready for a fight, essentially. <laughs> yeah, but, similarly, yeah. But I, I'm, it put me off, and I'm looking at them, and I'm like, that is so weird. And then they started dancing around in a circle. <laughs> and I'm, it was almost, like, I almost laughed. It was like, I was just like, what is going on? This is so silly. This is so ridiculous. <laughs> the next thing I know, I'm, I'm in the same room. I'm sitting up. They're not there. I, there was no period of me waking up. This is just, I was sitting up looking at them and I'm still sitting up and they're not there. <laughs> but now this is in November. There should be no moths at this time. I, I love moths. I, I spent years of my life. I would sit out at night with a black light and uh, they would come shining on a sheet and the moths would come and I'd identify the moths and take pictures of them. Yeah. I love yeah. moths. There should be yeah. no moths in late November. Yeah. A huge moth, uh, about an inch and a half, flies around the room lands on my right ear right. Oh. and starts buzzing. Oh, yes. Like, yeah. So you get yeah. that buzzing yeah. sound, but it's from... Yes, an, yes, yeah, from an insect. And yeah. instinct, instinctively, I just flicked it off my ear. Yeah, yeah. And But then I started looking for it. It's like, where's this moth? Because I, I love moths. I want, like, want to identify it. Never did find no, no. it. Never found a dead moth in my house. Never, you know, don't know it's where, when, or what. Yeah. But... yeah. It was this, such a different moment than I've ever had with these things. And it was so silly. That, and I literally sort of said, like, okay, if that's what you're going to give me, I'll take it. Like, if, you know, if, if, that, if that's what it's going to be from here, it's not. I, I've had some more intense things since then. But it was just so odd and so silly. I was wondering if you just had any of those moments ever that were just like, what? What is, what is this? This doesn't make any sense. You know, when I told you about the flu when I was a student, yeah. what I didn't tell you was as soon as I saw this, it looked like it was, I know this is, this sounds funny as well, but you know, the typical Batman cape, it was like he was wearing like a cape a bit like Bat Batman. And I remember thinking, please go away, please go away, hiding under the covers. And then I looked, he's still there. And I thought, right. Uh, and my lamp was on the opposite table, which involved running across the room, literally. So... I thought, can I be brave enough to run past him? Literally, I would have to pass him and go and put the lamp on. And then I thought, yeah, I'm going to try and do it because I just want him to go. So without looking at him, it was like I had this like tunnel vision. I thought, right, run across the room. I switched the lamp on. He immediately vanished. And I thought, and then I cursed him and I said, you sod, you're still here, aren't you? And I was swearing and cursing. And I said, why do you bother to appear in a cape? You're frightening me to death, you great big loony, you know, and I was calling him all sorts of things. And and then afterwards, I was quite contrite because my temperature went down afterwards and I thought, <laughs> could it have been something to do with him, you know? Well, was I in fact hallucinating? I, I, you know, I don't know, but I, I, with my history, of course, I, yeah. made it, I believed it was something solid and that yeah. had been there. When you mentioned about, the, you know, the dream and then you saw the fellow, you know, in real life, I think yeah. somehow dreams yeah. are tied into this stuff too. And I don't know how. Yes. Yeah, definitely. I, so my wife, who was a huge skeptic, but has, has seen some stuff that causes her to sleep with the light on. Yes, I sleep with the light on. That it's left me with that. I can't sleep in the dark. I was on the, I was doing a uh, paranormal conference with uh, a friend of mine and we it was in West Virginia and we had rented a Airbnb outside of the city we kind of wanted to be in a rural area and when we got there I looked around and there's a bunch of woods and I made a joke I said you know Bigfoot's going to come up and, and slap the house tonight we go off <laughs> we do the paranormal conference we come back that night and I was very excited because I was like oh my wife wasn't there I was like I can sleep with the lights out tonight I, you know I, I, I can get a good night's sleep not that I, I I've I've gotten used to sleep with the lights on. It's not that big a deal, but 
thinking to myself, I, I, he's sleeping with the lights out. I'm sleeping with the lights out. I have this dream where I'm getting texts from Grays. They're texting me. I don't know how I knew it was them, but it was a, their, their texts look different. They graphically look different on the phone than normal ones. But they said in text form, they said, when you sleep with the lights on, you're just avoiding confrontation with us. That's what so, the text said. And people say you can't read in your I, dreams. I mean, I read that. Why could have been? I yeah. wake up from that and I'm, you know, I'm dazed and I'm just trying to, you know, get up and, and use the restroom. And I sit up in bed and I was in a room with an outside wall about eight, 10 feet off the ground, right behind my head on the outside wall. It's a, it's a hit. Boom. On the house. And I just thought it's like two or three in the morning. I thought, I am not going outside to look for whatever that was. I, I used the bathroom, back yeah. to bed, r- right back to sleep. That is scary. But it's, it's, dreams are bound up in this somehow. You know, it's, it's like they, I don't know how they use both things or I don't, I don't know how it works, but it's, I, I can say like, I really do feel that dreams are somehow tied up with this stuff. Definitely. I wonder if there is an astral plane or dimension that they kind of try and meet us halfway on. Certainly considering that I initially dreamt about the Nordic ET and then I see him in reality. I mean, how do you explain that? You know, it's almost like these two separate races, I believe, of ETs seem to have quite similar ways of reaching us, if you will, because the greys also use dreams, of course. So you wonder... And this is where I come back to, I wonder if they have similar technologies because they might be members of some kind of confederation or something, I don't know. I know that sounds a bit Star trek but you wonder if, if that is why, because if, if there's a level, I've even theorised, is there a level of technology that you've got to come up to before you're even allowed into <laughs> that kind of confederation or whatever you want to call it you know yeah and if they're trying to pull us up by our bootstraps somehow to seeding technologies to us even you know quietly trying to to make us realize that if we're not careful we're going to destroy the only planet we've got certainly as a result of contact with them i feel that i've become more ecologically conscious of the fact you know that we are not doing very much good to the planet and we're still using fossil fuels in great amounts, aren't we? I mean, I think if if they, you know, they, David Grouch talks about they've hidden these technologies. If only they would let them out, maybe there would be cleaner ways of producing energy. Yeah. I just hope that happens. You know, I think we need disclosure if only for that reason alone. Sorry to, I've moved slightly Oh, offered. no, no. Just, no it's, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's just such a interesting and ask me, in two weeks, and my theory is going to change. You know, sometimes yeah. I think this is this is all out of body stuff. But then I talk to someone like you. You've certainly had physical effects. Have you ever come back with any marks or you know, quote unquote, implants or anything like that? I believe I've got implants because my husband. It's a standing joke between us that I set off security alarms in shops. We went on a recent trip to New York, and I actually got chased by a security. <laughs> Because I triggered the alarms in the shop. And uh, I regularly trigger the alarms in my supermarket where I shop at Tesco's here in England. And they, I've been chased a few t- and they can't find anything, of course. And also when I'm going through airport security, I've been stopped and I am made to take all my jewellery off, my watch off, everything, even my PSD rings. And they're baffled by me because they still can't find anything. And that often happens. So I suspect I might have an implant, possibly in my knee, because she she kept passing this thing over my leg and she was so puzzled. And I couldn't help laughing because every time she went past my knee with it, it triggered. Uh And she said, have you had uh, anything done to your knee or any implants? And I said, you know, meaning our medical implants. Right, right. I I said, not, no. And and how could I say to the woman, well, actually, I'm a lifelong abdu- abductee. Yeah, <laughs> no. Yeah. ET's bite have put these. I couldn't say that. Right, you know, right. You think I was a total loony. Right. So yes to the implants. And what was the other thing you asked me about the marks? Yes, I have been returned with uh, scoop, strange scoop marks. 
and uh, bruises in places and kind of under my arms here. Uh, I had two on my wrists recently in this in exactly the same place. They were kind of mirroring each other, and you wonder how the heck did they get there in such strange places. So yes, I, I have. Yeah, unfortunately, my wife is constantly now. Where'd you get that bruise? I'm like, I don't. I, yeah, I don't know. same here. I don't know. Yeah. Now yeah. I, I do have MS, so parts of me are numb. So that, you know that that could play into it, but uh, I, yeah, who knows. Often I found that that people don't just have one paranormal thing. In fact, the, over the course of doing this podcast, I've realized like it's at least as common, if not more common, for people to have multiple paranormal experiences. So, in your life, have you had you know any ghosts or anything else like? Yes, I'm actually psychometric. I believe I'm a natural psychic, and that kicked in when I hit puberty. That is in the female line. My grandmother was a spirit medium. I hear and smell, I'm clear, more clairaudient. Um, I hear spirits. I don't often see them, uh, but I have seen ghosts, yes. When I first went to work at this private hospital that I was telling you about in 1993, when I first started there, the very first day I saw the ghost of a little girl, what I didn't realise was that it was built on the site of an old cotton mill and, of course, children used to work in the cotton mills in Lancashire in the UK. And I saw this little girl skipping along the corridor and she was wearing really old-fashioned dress, uh, you know, like the big flouncy dresses that the and the pantaloons that they would wear underneath the, ch- the little girls in the Victorian time. And I just thought she was in fancy dress and visiting her grandparents. And I went down to Matron to say, who's that little girl that's on her own on the top floor skipping around? And she looked as solid as you or me. And she said, there aren't any visitors on the top floor. They would have had to come through me. Plus, they couldn't get up there anyway because the outside door was locked. And she said, have, have you seen our resident ghost? And I said, what resident ghost? Because, of course, I was only new. And she said that other staff had seen this little girl. Uh, and I, when I described her, she said, yeah, she said other staff had seen her. And so, of course, I was labelled from, from the very get-go that I was psychic no. and picking up on these things. I also saw the ghost of a, a, a man that had died in um, my father's house when I was younger. I'd be about 12. I used to go on my own to my dad's house because uh, my mum and dad broke up when I was 11 and I went. I used to go to see my dad. And he hadn't come home from work at the time and I, I saw a man in pyjamas at the top of the stairs and I ran out and ran next door to the neighbours. And I described this man and she said it sounds like the man that lived there on his own and he died there on his own. So, yes, I have seen ghosts, yeah, as well. So, yeah, it's strange. Yeah, yeah. so like I said, since doing this podcast, when I started the podcast, I think the general theory, and that was, you know, five, six years ago, I think the general feeling was people didn't have multiple experiences. There weren't, you know, like the multiple experiencer was a rare thing. And yeah. I think a lot of people yeah. wouldn't, like if they were, you know, for instance, writing a book about UFOs, they wouldn't talk about the other stuff because they thought it would take away from whatever they're writing about. But over the course of doing the podcast, like I said, the more people I talk to, it's it's at least as common for people who have experienced one thing to have other things too. If they've seen Bigfoot, they've seen ghosts or UFOs, they've seen UFOs, they've seen a ghost, et cetera, et cetera. It's at least as com- as com- it might be more common at this point. The number of people I talk to who just have multiple experiences, it's very interesting. I don't know. I just makes me think they're all somehow tied together. I don't know how. I don't. You yes, know, I it, think that could be the case. It, it's above or my maybe, pay grade, but yeah, yeah, maybe because you're picking up on one thing, you're more open to the other. It could be. Or do you attract them? You right. know, that's something. Yeah, I thought about. I mean, do is there something about us that attracts all of these things? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. By the very fact that you have this hypersensitivity to it naturally or is it something in our dna postulates that it could be that because of course there are if you go back far enough you know i mean if you if you just read graham hancock's books or freddie de silver's books about ancient civilizations i often wonder was there a breakaway civilization in the past that got into space and are they now coming back to find their own i've wondered all sorts of things you know and there is, of course, documented evidence of 
particularly say circa 10,500, 12,000 years ago when we there are a lot of myths through the tribes of Earth that we had these huge, this huge deluge or floods. And of course, we remember it in the story of Noah and that people came from the sky to help us, so to speak, to reset our civilization, to get it back up and running again. And they retaught us agriculture and medicine and all that kind, of, you know, and writing and mathematics was had to be retaught to us because we had a sort of reset. And there's lots of evidence for that. And you wonder if maybe some of these ET races are contacting you because they know that you've got their DNA or something. I, I really don't know, but yeah, I've, I've tree rising. And this isn't me alone. And I don't know whether I, you know, I developed this on my own or if I read it somewhere, but. One of the theories I find interesting is some people have posited that that it's us from the future, you know, coming back. Oh, yes. So well, that's another interesting theory. Yes. Yeah, it could be. That That is a possibility, isn't it, of course? So are they coming back and are we their ancestors? Yes. Yeah. I don't know. The silliness or whatever, you know, and perhaps they think, oh, we can pull grandma's leg a bit or whatever, you know, great grandmother or whatever. I really don't know, but yeah, it's yeah. a very interesting theory. Yeah. yeah. Again, I don't know if this was mind speak, and I don't know if I've put this thought into it because I have read other people who said similarly, but when whatever it was was by my bed, these grays, I was very, very angry. And I couldn't speak because they had me paralyzed, but I, w I was in a rage, and I, I remember yeah, thinking- it is enraging because you think, what, what right have you got to do that exactly. to me? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And that's yeah. what that's what I thought. I was like, you don't you can't do this. You don't have the right and yeah. they sort of did this mental brush off. Now I didn't hear words in my head to my recollection, but I got the feeling it's just like, no, and then we have every right. Yeah. And well, that's interesting. Yeah, it was it was very, very and like again, I don't know if it's mind speak and I don't know how much of this has been colored by reading other people's accounts and hearing other people's accounts. But that's that was my feeling on it, you know, just like being very enraged and thinking like you don't have the right, and them just brushing me off and just thinking and them just saying like well, we have the right, we of course we have the right. So I don't know, I don't know what that means, but uh, that if they are from the future, I guess that would you know sort of weave into that a bit, you know, if they felt like if, yes. if our DNA yeah, I mean, is their heritage in other in a sense. Yes, yeah, I don't know, but there's there's a school of thought that they think they've got permission, isn't there? on some level from us. I don't know whether you believe in pre-soul contracts or anything like that. I don't know whether I, I subscribe to that, but there is a theory that you kind of have agreed it before you came here. There's that school of thought. But there's also, uh, like you say, that they could think, well, you're actually related to us, so we do have the right. Yeah. Like you say, you know, it, say you could be somebody's great grandmother or whatever. Then they're perhaps thinking, well, you don't know this, but we know who you are. So therefore, you know, we're going to contact you whether you like it or not. So right. Because yeah. we, we really want to get to know you because actually you've left a trail of um, images on Facebook. Because I've actually thought about this and I thought, well, if it is someone from the future, you're going to leave this trail, aren't you, with modern technology as it stands. You're going to leave a trail of all your podcasts, so you're going to be well known. And anyone that descends from you is going to be able to find that. They're going to be able to trace podcasts of you and things like that, aren't right, they? Right, yeah. And they'll be fascinated by the fact that they have perhaps the first semi-famous ancestor or whatever. And you could think you could see that happening, couldn't you? They're all going to go back and look at, you know, we'd like to meet them. So, yes, that's a strong possibility, I think. So I, I really don't know... It's very interesting to postulate about it, you know. But yeah, yeah. That's that. that, that yeah. The end line is we don't know. I mean, you know. The, yes. And we, yeah. My hope is that one day we will, but my gut says we might not. And we, I kind of yeah. sit with that. I kind of sit with that idea. For me, it was Bigfoot. I when I got into it, I thought like, th I'll be able to solve this. I'll be able to. I'll be able to figure this out. And a certain time into it. I kind of had to sit myself down and like, no, you're not going to figure this out. It's it's a mystery. It's not a creature. It's it's something else. And I went through about a month of kind of depression about it, you know, because I was like... Yeah, I, I've been through that. Yeah, yeah and then you, at the end of that what, month, I, I sort of said to myself, well, do you, do you still enjoy this? Do you still... 
are, do you still find it interesting? Do you still find value in this? And the answer was yes. I said, well, go on then, go on and, and but accept the fact that you're not going to figure it out. So yeah, that's, that's yeah. where I sit. So, but I'm okay with that. You know, the, yeah. the world can, the world can have mysteries. I'm fine with that. Yeah. 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 It's, it's really strange, isn't it? I mean, I've even wondered if, I don't know whether you've heard of Mary uh, Rodwell, but she postulates that some of us, our souls at least, are not from here, that we've agreed to come here at this time in our history, which is, I actually believe there's a pivotal time that we're going through at the moment because disclosure is starting to happen, isn't it? And I wonder if we've all chosen to be here on some level at this time in our history. I've even thought about that. And have the ET some way of recognising that that you're really family in some way that we don't understand, you know, on a soul level. I even wondered that. Yeah. Big questions. Lorraine McAdam, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for sharing your stories with us. Thank you for taking extra time with us. Your book is called Phantoms in the Night or ETs, My Lifelong Experience of Contact with the Paranormal. Is it published now? Yes, it is. You can go on Amazon USA or Amazon UK. And if you just put Lorraine McAdam into the search bar, L-O-R-R-A-I-N-E, <laughs> M small C capital A D A M, Lorraine McAdam, it will bring my book up. And it's also on six books. And again, if you put my name into there, as I've spelled it, then it will filter and bring it up on six books collectiving so you can go to there as well to buy it i'll put links in the show notes as well for people so they can oh just yes click yeah did, did i send you the links to my book i can send you them if you like yeah go ahead and do that and i'll, I'll make sure yeah, to put we'll them in, in, yeah, in the right. show notes yeah okay well thank you for having me on though oh, thanks so much will you come back sometime i loved our conversation yes yes i, I would be quite happy to yeah, okay just, great great yeah great <laughs> all right have a great night yeah you too okay thank you all right thank you bye No curiosity of the week this week, but I do want to talk about our Etsy shop a little bit. Those new t-shirts should be up on Etsy next week. I just don't have time to add them before Alba Twitch Day. Got a busy week here, getting prepared for the big day. You have your sash ready? I do, my tiara. Mm -hmm. I will add a new item to the flowered pass section of the shop. I made a little zine, a little zine, a collection of like Catholic ephemera, like prayer cards and old photos and stuff. And an article about Louise Latou, who was a stigmatist, a mystic with the stigmata from the 1800s. So if in your Venn diagram you like late 80s goth scenes and Catholicism, you're going to love Tim Zine. <laughs> <laughs> Zines were my roots, you know. I started putting this together and I thought this would be a neat thing. The Flower Path on Patreon has a tier that people get merch every month at a certain tier, at the Orchid tier on the Flower Path. So I made these to give away to the Orchid tier people, but I made some extras, so I'll put them up there. It's got, like, old photos of nuns and priests and stuff and old prayer cards, and like I said, that article about Louise Leteau. I think it's pretty neat. I'm real happy with it. I'll probably do, I don't know, a couple, two or three of those a year as giveaways for the Flower Path patrons. I'll make the extras available. It's a good rationalization to keep collecting photos. Right? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, yeah. Virgin Mary bandanas are up there as well for the flower path. We'll bring those to Twitch Day. We'll see if anybody wants them. They'll be there. But for Strange Familiars, we have Strange Familiars t-shirts. Oh, that's, I did want to mention the Awoken Tree t-shirts. I think we have a small, medium, and large, maybe, in the blue Awoken Tree, the classic blue. And we have all sizes, at least right now, small through 2X in glow in the dark. Some of those, we only have a couple mm -hmm. in each size. The Awoken Tree design is going away. That has been in print in one form or another since the first episode of the podcast. It's not going away forever, but we wanted to make room for other designs. We kind of want to do more t-shirt designs. So if you want to get an Awoken Tree t-shirt and you don't want to wait till whenever the next time is we print them, we're not sure when that's going to be, you might want to go ahead and grab one now. They will be at Alba Twitch Day, but you can grab them on Etsy as well. Strange Familiar stickers are there. My artwork is there. If I did artwork for this episode, it'll be up there. 
<laughs> it's like you have to talk to your future self. Yeah, as, as we're recording this, I'm not sure if I'm going to have time to do artwork or not. I have other art and originals and prints up there, copies of my books and more. The shop name is Lost Grave. But if you type in Strange Familiars, you should see our stuff come up. I guess that's it for now. Hope to see everyone at Alpha <laughs> Twitch Day. I know everyone can't make it. But if you do make it, happy to see you there. If you don't make it, don't worry. We should have a lot of the merch, if not all of it, available on Etsy next week. If the totes sell out, we'll make more because, like I said, it was just kind of an experiment to see how they do. I don't know how they would do. All right. Until Alba Twitch Day. For some. <laughs> and until the next episode. For others, we'll see you. Thanks for listening, everybody. Looking for something to do after Halloween is over? Are you into the strange, bizarre, and unusual? On November 3rd, 4th, and 5th, the Strange Realities Conference is coming back to Nashville, Tennessee and streaming online. Come join us for three days exploring mysteries, the supernatural, the occult, weird history, and more. Featuring lectures, presentations, and workshops by Tim Banal, Zach Hunt, Leslin Vance, Bryn Collier, Tobias Whalen, Brent Rains, Joshua Cutchen, Kiki Dombrowski, Recluse, Nathan Isaac, Christopher Ernst, Aaron Gullius, David Metcalf, Timothy Renner, Mallory Samwitzki, Soraya Azkap, and special guest Steve Berg as your Master of Ceremonies. Make sure to join us for the fun and informative weekend online and at SIR Nashville November 3rd and 4th and online only November 5th. Tickets are available at strangerealitiesconference.com. Strange Familiars is a production of Dark Holler Arts. Intro and background music is by Stone Breath. If you want to purchase music or hear more, you can go to stonebreath.bandcamp.com. Strange Familiars is on Facebook, facebook.com slash strangefamiliars. We're on Instagram, at strangefamiliars, one word, no underscore. And you can find us on the web at strangefamiliars.com.